This is Love Your Work. On this show, we help you make it as a creative entrepreneur, find your unique voice, find the right mindset to succeed, and be the first to capitalize on new opportunities to make a living making your art. I'm David Cadavy. If you want to join us here on Love Your Work every Thursday, please hit subscribe on your podcast app and get your free creative productivity toolkit. Sign up at cadavy.net slash tools. Mark McGinnis is a creative coach, a poet, and a former psychotherapist and hypnotherapist. Stephen Pressfield, author of The War of Art, calls Mark an overeducated Brit who thinks deeply about stuff you and I have never heard of. Mark is the host of the 21st Century Creative Podcast. Actually, check me out over there. He had me on the show. It should be coming out soon. On the 21st Century Creative, Mark explores how to take advantage of the huge opportunities presented by the digital age. This at a time when there are more distractions than ever threatening to take you off course and fewer traditional safety nets to catch you when you fall. In this conversation, we will talk about click here to be creative, how to use mantras, chakras, and other sometimes thought of as woo things as like graphical user interfaces for altering your mental state. I thought this was really interesting. How the feeling action response loop can guide your creative direction. If you're wondering how to create work that really moves people, this is the key. How to use imposter syndrome to your advantage. It's a double-edged sword or a sushi knife, as you'll see. Use it carefully. Do you ever get stuck while working on a creative project? Maybe you're falling for the linear work distortion. Here's a tip from my book, The Heart to Start. Creative work doesn't come linearly. You don't write a book one word at a time from start to finish. No, creative work is messy and iterative. You get what you can out there and then you go from there. So watch out for when you're falling for the linear work distortion. You get really blocked and you risk quitting altogether. Find the part of the project on which you can make progress. It doesn't matter where. Todd Henry said he wants you to read The Heart to Start because too many people take their best work to the grave with them don't let that be you. If you're starting something new in 2019, now is the perfect time. Search for The Heart to Start on Amazon, Audible, or wherever books and audiobooks are sold. Here's Mark McGinnis. I'm here with Mark McGinnis. Uh, Mark, when you were a child, uh, what did you want to be when you grew up? And how does that relate to what you do now? The first version was I wanted to be a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Mm. Um, I'm not quite sure how that would relate. And then I was... Want... doesn't seem like a secure job. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of days are numbered, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, maybe I was nostalgic even as a child. Um, I, I wanted to be an artist for a long time. And then I wanted to be an architect and up until the point where I was told I had to do A-level maths and I went to the first lesson of A-level maths and decided I did not want to be an architect after that. Mm. So wait, was that in college? That was at what I guess you would call high school. So that was kind of sixth form age, oh, 16 right, yes. to 18. Yes. Yeah, I didn't want to be an architect because I didn't enjoy drawing straight lines. I think that was it. <laughs> That was it for me. Uh, so, hmm, any are there any 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 patterns there uh, between what you wanted to do and what you're doing now? Well, the art actually, because I remember even as a kid, it, there was this really interesting phenomenon that if I was in the right mood, I could draw really well. Well, I mean, you know, really well for what I considered really well, and the drawing basically worked. It, it would come out okay, but. It, if I wasn't in the right mood, and I, I remember explaining it to my parents, oh, I'm in a drawing mood now. I need the I need the the pencils and paper. And if I, but if I wasn't in a drawing mood, then it wouldn't come out right. And however hard I tried, and at that point, it just seemed like one of those things, like the weather. Well, I was either in the mood or or I wasn't. But you know, looking back, it's interesting that even then I was kind. I had this meta curiosity about my own creativity mm -hmm. and what I ended up doing with clients, you know, particularly when I, I originally started my professional practice, I was doing hypnotherapy. And that was all my initial coaching with creatives was all based on the idea of helping get people to get into a creative 
state of mind where they could perform at their best or, you know, write or draw or, or, or otherwise create at their best. So, you know, I hadn't really thought about that for a long time, but your, your question just made me remember that thing of the drawing moods when I was a kid. Hmm. Yeah. I don't, I mean, I don't think that I recall thinking that much about mood. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to draw all the time. It, it seemed like so that's interesting that you had, uh, that it was, it was mood based for you. Is that something that you have? I mean, are you one of these people who sits and waits for inspiration or do you, uh, kind of force yourself to, to do creative work even when you don't feel like it? Well, in a way it's neither because I think what I've done is just discovered how to get in the right mood or in the right state. Mm -hmm. Um, which, you know, on a mm. daily basis is, is largely habit. Um, or the more glamorous term would be ritual. So I do my, you know, morning routine, walk the kids to school, come home, do my meditation practice, brew some coffee, put some music on. And, you know, that, that pattern and my unconscious mind or my emotional brain or whatever you like to call it has learned to associate that with, okay, now it's time to output some writing. So usually by the time I've gone through that process, I'm ready to, to write something. Right. And for you, it is, but that's kind of the same every day, uh, right? Are there, are there that often situations where you're not in a familiar situation or you're not in a familiar routine or you're not in a familiar uh, schedule where, oh no, I'm in the wrong mind state and I need to get myself into another mind state. Well, I guess an obvious one is if I'm doing a uh, public speaking engagement. Oh, right. You know, I need to, whether I'm jet lagged or whether it's been a bad day or a good day or whether, um, you know, whether the weather's good, whatever else is going on in my life, I know if I've made a commitment to an audience, I need to be in a good state of mind to go out there and deliver and and be the best version I can be of myself for them. So I do very consciously in that situation, I, I go through a kind of mental visualization, uh, make sure that the the space is set up, make sure I've done my preparation so that when I walk on stage, it says Mark the speaker, not Mark the guy who was, I don't know, having problems with his phone earlier today, or, you know, Mark who's got annoyed by something in the, the news or, or, or whatever, or even, you know, just Mark who'd rather just be sat in the corner reading a book. So there's, you know, I'm, I'm definitely, when the situation calls for it, I, I'm very focused on how can I pull out the best version of me for this particular situation, whatever that is. Well, in the case of getting prepared to speak, I mean, I can relate to that. You, there's a moment where you have to perform uh, or you have to be in a certain state and like it has to happen right now. You can't change the schedule. Yeah. And uh, I've, that's, I've experienced that speaking where, yeah, maybe I'm even sick or something and you just got to look good for a little while. <laughs> and uh, it's it's the same same way with even doing podcast interviews, too. It's like, quite honestly, I don't I don't always feel like having a conversation. <laughs> but, you know, you have to agree to a time ahead of time and you don't want to be rude and reschedule on your guests or something. And you, you got to get yourself into that state. And then I often find once I'm in that state uh, that it feels good, especially after I have the conversation, I have that, you know, sort of glow or, 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 or feeling good. I would love to hear some specifics about how you get yourself into that state when you are getting ready to speak and you know, maybe you're a little jet lagged, et cetera. You, you talked a little bit about a visualization. I'd love to hear like specifically um, how, what you do. So this is something I learned years ago. When I did a course on Hawaiian Huna, which again, I'm, no, I'm not an expert on this at all, but I understand it's the, uh, you know, a, a spiritual tradition in, in Hawaii. And they taught us a, a visualization where you basically expand your whole awareness to fill the room. And mm -hmm. as a kind of introverted British guy, this, <laughs> this was, this is not the typical state that I was in. Uh, certainly at uh, uh, that stage of my life, or, or indeed now most of my time, my personal space is probably fairly small. Uh, I'm quite happy just being left to my own devices. But of course, if I'm there 
responsible for the experience those people have in that room, which I believe I am, if I'm the speaker, then I, I use this visualization to extend my consciousness, if you like, out to either side, to the walls, to mm -hmm. the wall in front of me, even the wall behind me. So, uh, you know, I like to think that even if that door opens behind me, I'm going to be aware of it and I'm going to know who's coming in because every, and then I'm mentally welcoming people into that space. Uh, so whoever walks through that door, wh wherever I am, even if it's on the other side of the world, this is my space for that half hour or hour or however long it is. And I'll also do a visualization of my chakras opening up just to kind of connect everything up and op open me up to the the bigger world out there. And wait, wait, can you get more specific about the, the chakra thing? I, I'm not necessarily familiar with that. Is that certain points in your body expanding to fill the room, like a visualization of that? How does that go? Yeah. And again, I'm not an expert on the chakras, but years ago I did some work with a friend who's a medium and she taught me to do this. So there are seven chakras starting from the, the base down in, in your pelvis all the way up to the tip of your uh, head. And there's a different color for each one. So you visualize bright red down at the base. Then it goes orange. Then we go to yellow, green, yellow. blue, etc. So you're basically going through the, the rainbow spectrum. And the idea is that each one is unlocking a particular kind of energy, physical, sexual, emotional, mental, spiritual. And when the chakras are open, then you're connected, you know, th there's no blocks. And you're able to access the whole of you uh, in whatever activity you, you're doing. Now, you could use that for writing, you could use it for painting. I like to use it as a for speaking, because I think, well, I've got to bring the whole of me there. You know, it's it's very much an embodied, you know, the whole point of of doing a physical uh, speaking gig is is to actually be in the room with people and connect with their energy. So that's one thing that I used to really consciously bring myself out of myself, because I know I am deeply introverted. And, you know, the, we can't have introverted guy walking out on stage in front of a thousand people. Now, I've got a lot of, you know, engineers in my audience. They're, they're very uh, rational and scientific. And so mm -hmm. I'm sure that there's a, a good portion of them that when they hear somebody talking about chakras, they, they uh, have a knee jerk reaction to that and, you know, want to turn off the podcast or something. But I think that this is useful whether there's a scientific basis to it or not. And who knows if there is, I, I, I don't know the research, well, I think um, but, the, the but analogy it, you know, would, as far as visualization, it's, it's, yeah, it helps. So I think the analogy I would give, you know, if there's a skeptical engineer out there and, and fair enough, if so, um, think about it as the difference between hardware and software. When you log into your favorite web application, it, it's probably nicely designed to be really user friendly, and you press this button to do the one thing that you've come in there to do. Yeah, but and the colors will be designed with you in mind, and you know, there's the whole user interface experience. But that, you know, that's very different from what's actually going on under the hood with all the the bits and bytes and the electronic components and so on. So the way I think of it is anything, whether it's any kind of ideology or mental system you can think of, if you wish, just as a software, and it will activate certain parts of your your own hardware. And we shouldn't forget the emotional aspects of this too, because even if you just look at the anatomy, the emotional brain is pretty critical in the brain. If you're, all you're doing is thinking through the central, you know, the frontal lobes, you're not going to have a big impact, and you're not going to access the whole of your abilities and talents. I love this metaphor so much of thinking of it like as, as like a user interface for different visualizations or, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about, uh, you know, in, in, in one of my books, I talk about mantras for, for, for writing a book, like right. things, it's almost like a command line interface. If you can say certain phrases to yourself, then you can change the operation of your brain and, and your physiology in a certain way. 
Uh, yeah. So I love that idea of having you know, uh, a, a concrete thing that you can manipulate, whether it's words or a visualization that creates this response in your body. Yeah, well, I mean, when I was a hypnotherapist, we used to call it anchors. So the, mm -hmm. the mantra could be an anchor, an image can be an anchor, a posture can be an anchor, uh, another person or another kind of situation can be an anchor that, that produces that state. It's like the, you know, the equivalent of clicking on the, um, you know, the desktop icon to open up the application. You, mm -hmm. you, you repeat your mantra, then that opens up the writing application inside your brain to continue the technological metaphor. I, I love psychotherapy, or not psycho, but, uh, sorry, uh, hypnotherapy. I love the hypnotherapy so much. We, we've had, uh, Andrew Johnson on the show. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's, he's the UK. He makes these wonderful hypnotherapy apps, mm -hmm. um, such as Relax. And, and he's, he's got one called Holistrio now that has all these different programs in it for, uh, controlling anxiety, building confidence, uh, anger management, et cetera, these things. And, I do a session with one of his apps almost every day. Right. And it's incredible. I, 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 I never would have expected. I think I was, I was like a, a hypnotherapy skeptic, I think, or maybe not even a skeptic. It was just I was ignorant of it. I didn't really know how powerful uh, it is. And so it's, but it's still mysterious to me. And I, it, it makes me wonder as somebody who has practiced hypnotherapy, is is there are there any principles or ideas that you can bring out that would be useful for somebody that they could use on themselves in some way like for example this idea of anchors yeah i mean and you don't need to get too mysterious about it i mean you could just say it's basically basic pavlovian stimulus response that if you but the important thing is if you want to anchor a particular state say it's a writing state or a public speaking state or a music playing state or even a programming state, then what you want is to find something that is going to be pretty unique and unmistakable. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, you know, this is why we have, you know, some people have these really exotic rituals with candles and incense and, you know, they build a huge great temple or whatever, because by the time you've gone through that set of anchors, you're in a very different state to when you were walking down the street before you went in. But it can be as, as simple and, and every day as, for instance, I have a, uh, a lovely coffee cup from Japan, and it has all the different Star Wars characters um, in the enamel on the outside with Japanese characters for their names. That was a present from my wife. And I only drink coffee in the morning. And I only ever drink it from this Japanese cup. And nobody else is allowed to drink from that cup. So obviously it then becomes magically charged with my mm -hmm. writing prowess. And so that's the only time I, I experienced that, that particular anchor during my day. So it's fairly easy for that to become associated with the act of writing. And particularly if I've done my meditation practice just before, there'll be a bit of in incense in the air left over from that. And then I'm drinking the coffee in um, smell. Neuroscientists have shown is very, you, you're uh, strongly connected. You've got uh, receptors from the nose going into the emotional brain, which is why scents and perfumes and smells of all kinds tend to evoke memories, which are basically another form of state. So I would say if you're listening to this and you want to be able to develop a fairly reliable anchor for your own preferred state, then look for those unique anchors. It could be the, you know, I mean, say you're doing martial arts, you get trained into your kit and then you go out and you do your warm up on the mat. Well, probably you're going to be in a very different state after five minutes of doing that, wearing that outfit that you never wear the rest of the week than you would be if you were performing those same exercises on the rug at home. I'm trying to remember who it was that was in uh, the great book, Daily Rituals, who was saying, uh, you know, that it could be anything that you could, you could say to yourself, oh, I need to wear uh, mittens and earmuffs and spin around eight times 
and 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 that makes me yeah. creative. And as long as you decide that that that's the thing and you practice it, then eventually that becomes this great um, uh, like trigger for getting you into this state. That's it, and and that's a great book. Um, and you know, sports players as well. I used to do a little bit of work with professional golfers and other sports players, and they have these little superstitions, as they call them. You know, I have to always be the last one out of the dressing room, or I have to wear put this sock on before this one, or I always have to have this particular number. And when we're looking on the outside at these rituals, we tend to call them superstitions and focus on the you know the idea of the artist and and sports people being a little eccentric but actually what you the more eccentric the better because the more unique it will be and therefore the more unmistakable it will be and therefore the more reliable it will be when you want to get into that high performance state and when it comes to your your coffee cup do you ever find yourself tempted to uh drink out of that coffee cup during a, a weekend or a time when you aren't going to be writing immediately afterwards? Because I could see that how that could be a bit like if a button on a website just every fifth time uh, went to a different place than, than where it was supposed to go. You, you know what been, I mean? Yeah, I've never been tempted to do that. I don't know why. <laughs> Um, and it's not like that's completely essential. I mean, even just things like have a particular brand type of... Um, moleskin notebook that i use and a particular type of pen and that becomes a little anchor so it's really anything that you use consistently and uniquely in that context can start to have these positive associations and just just make it just that little easier to get into the right frame of mind for you know doing something complex or creative or or challenging in another way and i will say that like the only drawback to that is that sometimes you get in these situations where for whatever reason you can't do your ritual the way that, you know, the way that you normally do. Um, and I don't really know what the answer is for, for those situations. Even I know for myself. Then, like, sorry, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud here. Go ahead. Even then, you know, I could visualize my coffee cup. Oh, yeah. You know, you can call it to mind and, and you know, re really imagine and smell it. And you just close my eyes for 30 seconds, I could do that. The, the times when I find myself in a situation like that are often when I'm traveling mm. and, you know, you're in a hotel room or you're, you are in a different time zone. Like all this thing, all these things are getting, um, are, are, are getting thrown in the air and it depends upon what I'm working on. But sometimes if it's, if it's a writing thing, I personally will try to kind of take advantage of that because I see my creative ideas as like, wide or narrow creativity in that if I am in my daily routine, it's sort of narrow creativity. And then I'm just trying to sit down and generate work with the hopes that some of it's going to be good. But if I'm in a situation where I've, I, I have had my uh, rituals and habits um, thrown into disarray because of some other force, then I try to use that to hopefully jostle bigger, higher level 30,000 foot thoughts um, out of what I'm doing. Is that anything that, that, that you do when you're in these situations where you can't control um, repeating your ritual or your habit? Well, I'm just, you know, listening to you think, and I don't know if this is true for you, but for me, I think airplanes and trains have become anchors because very wow. often it's a very nice quiet space i can sit down i can you know no one's going to call me i've got the perfect excuse not to get back to anyone immediately uh maybe there's something nice to drink or something if i'm on the train there's nice scenery to look at and it's, it, i've i've got started on a lot of pieces of writing that way it really feels like an, a real in-between state that i find very creative yeah i think that's when i get when I jostle out the the sort of larger creative ideas for myself. Though I will say that if I'm going to get on a plane, it's probably a better idea if I kind of decide ahead of time mm. what I'm going to work on creatively. Otherwise, that in-flight entertainment system with that screen that's like in your face that you can't even turn off um, right. will suck you in. Or, or me, <laughs> it will suck me in sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, that 
that can happen too. I think another thing I think is really important, and this is much easier with the advent of smartphones, is having your tools always within arm's reach. So for instance, uh, you know, poetry is my own art form. And it's really hard to actually sit down and get an idea for a great lyric poem at nine o'clock on a Monday morning. You know, even, even if I've, I've got the magic coffee pot, quite often the best ideas will come as I'm walking down the street or in the dentist waiting room or sitting on the tube. And I find a, a real um, game changer for me has been installing the Scrivener app on my phone. And that means it's synced with the desktop version of Scrivener. So, which oh, is I didn't even know that you could do that. Oh, you can. Gosh, this this is going to be a glorious day for you, David. <laughs> Though I wonder so, if it's the new version of a Scrivener that only works with uh, High Sierra or whatever the no. But I think both. Software. I think both versions of Scrivener do it because I remember mm-hmm. having to transition. So, I use Scrivener for all my book projects and absolutely love it. And when I saw that they had an iPhone app. I stupidly thought, what's the point of that? You know, I can't write a whole book on an app. But when I thought about the implications, I realized this means I can have all my poems that I'm currently working on in my pocket wherever I go. And the way a lot of poetry gets written, at least for me, is it's it's going back and having another look and, and tweaking a bit more and, and realizing, oh, that line's not right, I'll fix that. And that, that comma needs to shift too. And oh, you know, and then, and then a few more lines start to come out. And I just do a bit and a bit and a bit. And having Scrivener on my phone has just been absolutely invaluable for mm. that. And then when I save it, it's synced to the desktop. So that when I go, you know, I'm back at the office, I can have a, another look at it and get the hood up on it from there. So I would say, you know, whatever your, creative tools are for capturing and, and working on stuff, try and get it as, so that it's always within arm's reach. We're going to take a quick break. It's very cool to have a university sponsoring the show, University of California, Irvine's Division of Continuing Education. UC Irvine is ranked in the top 10 of U.S. public universities. Their Division of Continuing Education has been offering education to adult learners in Orange County since 1962, but you do not have to be in Orange County to learn at UCI. UCI's online courses offer flexibility and a real immersive online classroom experience because you get to collaborate with your peers. And there are a ton of certificate programs and specialized studies programs available. Some I thought that looked cool were blockchain technologies, film and media studies, digital marketing, and modern coffee production in Colombia. Whatever you want to study, you can do it on your own time, advance your career, in as little as six months. UCI's Division of Continuing Education wants you to know spring is around the corner, and that means spring quarter is coming up, and registration is open. So visit ce.uci.edu slash podcast to learn more. That's ce, as in continuing education, dot uci.edu slash podcast to learn more. I use Evernote for some things and I use Scrivener for other things, which can be confusing at times. But I think that one of the things that has been very useful for me in making use of those little pockets of time that you're waiting for the dentist, things like that, is is something that I, I, I wish somebody would have told me this, which is that the the final creative product that you see, whether it is a poem or a book or a blog post, that's not what the process looked like. And just by giving myself that permission, I'm able to um, I'm able to make a lot of progress on creative projects in those pockets of time because I give myself permission to not have something very polished. Just as an example, yesterday I was uh, I was I was at the doctor yesterday and I was waiting for in between various tests that I was doing. And I then just had some podcast interviews that were loaded on my overcast. And I was able to listen to them while I was waiting. And I just casually took notes about what we're talking about in the conversation. And then then I'm able to make progress, but also I'm able to use the, you know, the incubation, which is part of the creative pro- process. Um, I know that when I return and sit down in front of a keyboard, I'll already have all this stuff there that I can uh, 
that I can turn into something that is better digested. And I think before I just kind of thought that I needed to sit down and write stuff and it would come out perfect. And so that's a, a tough sell when you're in one of these situations, like you're waiting in line. Is there a way that you think about um, the progression of your creative projects or are you somebody who keeps plodding along and trying to uh, make it a finished product from the very beginning? It, the Renaissance spoiled this for us because before then, artists were basically craftsmen, nearly always men, by the way. Um, and they didn't have this special divine status. And it was just taken as read that you would have a load of working drawings or you would, you know, you would have to work on something because it, it was a piece of work in order to make it good and finished and polished. And then something happened round about the Renaissance where we have this idea of the divine genius touched by God or touched by the muse. Choose your deity as you prefer. And so, for instance, we get Michelangelo burning his drawings because he didn't want the world to see the grubby little secret that he'd actually worked and he'd sketched and he'd revised. And, but, you know, he, he wanted the world to see the finished product because it's great for his brand. And, um, and ever since then, and the, the romantics, much as I love them, they, they kind of fostered this myth too, the idea that you get the, you know, the poem will come to you or, the, you know, in a, in a fit of inspiration and, and there it is. And anyone who, who has to work at it the old fashioned way is a bit of a hack. And, you know, really, you know, I, having looked into the history of creativity, I had a great chance to do this when I did my master's 10 years or so ago. And also working day in, day out with brilliant creatives uh, as coaching clients, you know, I get to see what goes on behind the scenes. And trust me, it's messy. Mm -hmm. And it's provisional. And it's, it gets revised and it gets worked up. That's, that's how you make something great. And actually that's the fun of it is starting off with a sketch and then working it and tweaking it. And, you know, I'm reading a great book by the, the Scottish poet, Don Patterson, all about um, his theory of poetry and how it's written. And one thing he says is, you know, very often the better poet is the person who can stand staring at the line for an hour longer than anyone else just to get it right. And so that, well, that's interesting because that is, I don't know, I, I love the, the Michelangelo example because that's something that I've, uh, sort of a myth I've tried to bust on on the show. We've had Ross King who wrote uh, The Pope's Ceiling, and it was really interesting to hear about his process and how, you know, he's sketching from this library of terracotta hands and uh, and drapery set in plaster to create these images right. and he's collecting all that stuff together. And that's all the, in this library of knowledge that he has even, and, and this is one that I, I hear uh, cited very often is this quote that, Oh, how did you, uh, how did you sculpt the David? Well, I just removed everything that wasn't David. Well, the way he sculpted it <laughs> was he first made like a little maquette, you know, made a bunch of small versions of it. And then even created this thing where he, he had it vertically, or horizontally uh, lowered into water and he could lift it up crank with a little crank little bit by bit and whatever was revealed he could uh, carve that part out of the out of the marble and so it was all kind of planned ahead of time and but yeah, like you said he makes it sound like it like it's some sort of magic it, it sounds good though I mean it's, it, 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 he's kind of he's not exactly telling a lie but he's being a little bit economical with the truth is he not <laughs> yes. Yes, it's working out great. But I thought it was interesting that you were talking about the, the poet that can stare at a line for so long. And um, I don't know, for me, that's so at odds with the way that I create things because I'm very much barf this stuff out and yeah. then go over it again and again or, or rewrite it again and again and again. <laughs> um, so I think there's different styles of uh, well, I, I actually creating. Think I think that's what Don's talking about is, is that you stare at the line, you know, you, you barf it out and you go, no, that's not quite it. And then you, you have uh, another, you, then you tweak it and then you look at it again and you, and then there's a certain point where, where it's like the point I used to get to in chess, 
you know, I, I would stare at the board and I would think a certain number of moves ahead and then my brain would start to hurt. And I would just think, oh, you know, mm. I'll make my move. Well, a grandmaster is someone <laughs> who's got the patience to keep looking and looking and looking. And I was never going to do that at chess, but because maybe because I don't love chess as, as much as I love poetry. But with a poetic line, I can come back and come back and come back and keep looking until I get that feeling of, yeah, that's right. Yes. Now, back to habits and having these rituals and, and anchors, as you were describing them, to get us into uh, a certain creative mode. I'm beginning to think about um, identity and how identity is important to us being able to do our work. Just as an example, I, I wrote about recently that, um, well, a few years ago, I really changed my appearance. <laughs> I started, I grew a big beard. Mm -hmm. I got ridiculous glasses. And then, you know, that was when I decided that I was going to be a writer. And yeah. so, <laughs> and it was like I was, I was forming my identity so I could convince myself I was a writer along with all these habits and stuff. And now that I've written enough, I think, you know, somebody could probably shave my head in my face and make me get LASIK and I would probably still be able to, to, to write. Do you ever find that there are these things that you hold on to uh, a habit or a ritual um, because your identity isn't yet solidified in that thing? Is that something that happens with you? I'm not quite sure I would relate it to, to habit or ritual Im immediately, but I do think, you know, the identity question is a good one because like anything else in the universe, it can be a two-edged sword. So on the one hand, I think there is something empowering about owning your identity and saying, okay, I'm going to be a writer or I'm going to be an artist or I'm going to be a singer and, and therefore I'm going to commit to, to doing the work to become a, a pro and, and to get good at this. On the other hand, I have met people who get stuck agonizing over the question, am I a real writer? Am I a real artist? Am I a real whatever it is? And if I see somebody getting stuck with that, then, you know, my answer is, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. History will decide that. But forget being a writer or being this or being that. What about writing? Yeah, let's focus on doing mm. some writing. Can you do that? And so sometimes it can be empowering, sometimes it can be an obstacle. So, you know, a, a bit of self-awareness. I think that's a good point because the, the action is very important. And, you know, you we've all met people who, and we've all probably all been in this person, who think that they're a certain thing, whether it's an entrepreneur or, or a writer, and they're, 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 going through the motions, they're going to the meetups or the conferences or they're, they're wearing the clothes or they're dressing that way or they've got the gear and they're not doing it. So it can be a double-edged sword, like you said. Yeah, and I don't think there's, and there's nothing wrong with trying it on, you know, try, right. tr like trying on the clothes and seeing if they fit and trying the walk and trying the moves and having a, you know, and... Uh, I think there's a lot to be said for curiosity and experimentation. Um, but there's also a point where you think, well, okay, am I, am I going to do this or not? Yeah, you have to be careful. And I mean, there's other other phenomena that happen. I think there's a lot of different phenomena in creative work where you um, where it feels good, uh, yeah. but it's actually a thing that feels good that is at, totally at the detriment of you being able to do your work. And so this, these identity things can be one of those things is feeling or thinking yourself to be this certain uh, type of thing without doing the, the action. Um, it also happens in, in, in uh, the, phenomena, uh, the phenomenon of um, basking in reflected glory, where you worship certain heroes and somehow through the act of doing that, you feel good like you can you feel almost like those accomplishments are yours mm. when they're clearly not and this is something that i personally struggle with a lot is is identifying these things that feel good whenever i find myself feeling good <laughs> when i'm doing my creative work or or afterwards um i i, I make it a point to try to ask myself that question of whether uh, whether it's a false um, good feeling. Is this actually bringing me toward the thing that I, that I want? Is, is that 
something that you observe or in, in your clients or or in your own practice? Well, I think certainly being aware of the feeling is is important, and it's you know again the the more mindful you are, the more aware you are, the more the easier it is to distinguish between oh that's a a genuine feeling that I'm on the right track, and this is a I don't know bigging myself up or a you know, getting enthusiastic in the wrong way. Mm-hmm. I think for me, you know, the ultimate um, test is, well, what am I producing? Is it work that I'm satisfied with and that people whose opinions I respect are, you know, giving me good feedback on? Or, you know, is you know, is this one of those things that kind of felt good at the time, then you know, you show it to a trusted critic or you put it out in front of your audience and and it the response comes back that it wasn't so great. And then sometimes, I, you know, I can think of times where I've looked back and thought, actually, yeah, it wasn't really that. It wasn't really happening for me. Even, you know, when I mm. w- was sat at the, the kitchen table scribbling away and uh, and and so I use that as a way of distinguishing. Okay, that that feeling that I had then is a little bit of a blind alley. So hopefully I'll be able to recognize it and avoid it next time. Right. This is something. Yeah, I'm constantly trying to get a, a, a feeling for how I actually feel about the thing that I'm creating because it seems to be very consistent that that uh, if if I am onto something, I usually feel it. Like my blood is pumping harder. Yeah. Um, I, I'm excited about it in, in, I think the, supposedly the right way, I guess it, it, it seems like it's rarely a complete accident that, uh, you know, I put something out there and I'm not really feeling it too much and, and people go nuts for it. That, that, that I can't recall that ever happening. Yeah, no, I don't remember that happening either. <laughs> um, I think it's, yeah, I, I think as long as you've got that feedback loop between feeling action and response whatever the response is that you're looking for, then you, you're you probably not going to end up being too deluded. Mm-hmm. You know, if it's purely just about how I feel and, you know, the, the actual feedback I'm getting is people aren't really getting into it and it, it's not it, it, it's not provoking the kind of response I want, then actually, you know, maybe I am just in my comfort zone of, of self-delusion. Now, on the other hand, sometimes you really are excited about something and people still just aren't getting it. Well, then it depends on who the people are, right? And I think it's really important to have in your life somebody who is that a, a really discerning critic and can really give you great feedback on, yeah, that's good, and no, that isn't. I mean, you know, I've, mm-hmm. I've had several mentors who have performed that valuable service for me in fields as diverse as psychotherapy and poetry and copywriting and... Um, it's it's really uh, an invaluable experience, and and you know, I think the ultimate value of a mentor is when you can internalize that um, critical faculty that they bring to it, that discernment, to the point where you kind of where you can do it yourself. You kind of know beforehand yeah. what they're going to say. Yes, what would, exactly. What would this know, person I mean, say? You know, I work with my poetry mentor Mimi Calvati about. 15 years or so and you know by now I can look at a draft and think well okay what would Mimi say about this Mm -hmm. and so I probably don't take up too much of her time with you know the basics the way I did in the beginning. So you were a hypnotherapist now you're doing creative coaching and I think that that stemmed from your uh, hypnotherapy practice the creative coaching. Uh, How did that happen? what sort of situation are people in when they decide that they, they need to hire a creative coach? Uh, okay, so, I mean, the coaching's changed a lot. So back in the mid-90s, I was doing, uh, practicing hypnotherapy and other kinds of psychotherapy. And occasionally I would get a client in the room. I mean, I, I would get people consulting me for all kinds of things, anxiety, depression, stopping smoking, relationship issues, whatever. But occasionally I would get, for instance, a novelist with writer's block saying, can you, can you help me get unstuck? Or an actor who came in and said, look, I'm in a show in the West End of London and I'm terrified to go out 
on stage every night. I'm worried it's going to ruin my career. Can you help me? Or I'm a film director and it's mind-bendingly stressful trying to get this film made and I, I need to be the leader on set. Can you help me? And they were the clients that I enjoyed working with the most because because I was a writer myself, I was on their wavelength. And the energy and the creativity and sometimes the, you know, the downright fun we would have in the sessions. I was thinking, well, this is, is this really therapy? And I thought, actually, most of these people don't have a clinical mental health condition. But they do, they are engaged in what Seth Godin would later come to call emotional labor. You know, we, they put their heart and soul into their work. And so maybe I can offer a space for them to work on the heart and soul and the actions that follow from that. And so that's when I started calling it coaching way back before coaching was really a thing. And, you know, that developed that as a specialism. And then later on, I worked in large organizations doing more corporate style executive coaching and training. And that was great because I learned how to do, you know, how to explore the world of business. But ultimately, I wasn't a, you know, I'm not a corporate guy. And I decided to refocus purely on the creative industries, creative entrepreneurs, artists of, of all shapes and forms. And that's really what I do these days. So it's very much a mm -hmm. mixture of the internal kind of stuff we talked about, like state management, triggers, creative process, but also with a very strong bias to action. I mean, you know, ultimately I say, look, there's no point talking to me unless you're going to go away and do something different and game changing for you in your creative work, in your career, or in your business, if you're an entrepreneur. So I think those are the three main areas people come for me these days. is something to do with their work, something to do with their professional development, use their professional profile, or, you know, business results, like they want to earn more money. So when people are creatively blocked, do you happen to see any patterns that you could categorize into the different types of blocks there are, such as, you know, imposter syndrome is, is one. And years ago, I wrote a whole book about this. I called it 20 Creative Blocks, where I got everybody, not everybody, I, but I got people who were reading my blog to send me in their creative blocks. Mm -hmm. And I came up with about 20 different ones. So maybe we could link to that in the show notes. It's, sure, sure. it's not something I kind of consciously think about these days very much i mean it's the way i coach is quite organic and uh, improvisational so um the way people um you know I'm, I'm just in the moment with the client and so i'm not really necessarily thinking so much about well this category or that category gotcha um Cause i've been thinking about this a lot like you know, imposter syndrome being one of these things where i, I could think it could come from Either you're, you're underestimating your worth or you are, or you have a grandiose or distorted idea of what is required of you to go forward with the thing that you're doing. I, I don't know if that makes sense to you, if there's any other um, facets to something like it's, imposter syndrome it, it that you would could see. well be a, a bit of both and i would have to i would say imposter syndrome is pretty well epidemic in the creative industries and mm -hmm. uh, most other fields of high achievement where i've coached people be, and, and i think in up to a point it's healthy because if you're the kind of person who thinks you've got it made and who thinks you don't have much to learn you're maybe not going to be paying attention to that which you know you that will help you get better whether that's mm -hmm. your own internal standards or external feedback. So I think overconfidence can be as, as well, actually it can be even more damaging externally because you're right. out there like the, like the bull in the China shop, just, you know, destroying stuff and, and creating havoc. So I, and I get, you know, every client I've ever worked with, I think has had a very strong and active inner critic and one of the first things I will say to a client is, well, be grateful for that critic. Because you can go out and look on the internet and you can look in the wider world and you can see all the mediocre products and artworks that are put out by people who don't have a strong critical faculty, who don't have the high standards, who don't have that drive to perfection that you have in your sphere. 
And so, again, it's the two-edged sword thing. Up to a point, it's valuable and useful. And beyond that point, it can become damaging. So the analogy I use for the inner critic is it's a bit like if you've got a, a Japanese sushi chef has got an extremely sharp knife, you know, so, so sharp that it will you know, cut you if you just look at it almost. And, and he needs it. And it usually is, again, it usually is a he. Um, there's a few female Japanese sushi chefs, but it's very much a, a male dominated industry. But, you know, he needs that knife to be sharp to do his work. But at the end of the day, he puts it away. He keeps it somewhere safe. He doesn't take, he doesn't stick it in his back pocket and walk down the street. He doesn't use it to point at when he's in the bar with a friend or gesture with to, you know, to, to make an anecdote. And it's, um, and in a way, that's what we do if, if we let our inner critic run amok. If it's criticizing ourselves and our environment and our friends and, and, and family and whatever, you, you can get into a space where you're never satisfied with anything. We've talked about so much interesting stuff today. Uh, I wonder, do you have a final message that would summarize our conversation? I think maybe something around this idea of... of uh, uh, of thoughts or visualizations being an interface, maybe on that theme, anything that you would like to leave our listeners with? Well, I would like to say that, you know, empowerment starts from within. You know, it's very easy to say, well, I, you know, I want to do this, that, and the other. But if you start with a bit of self-awareness, and a bit of discernment around your own states and really get curious and interested about what works and what doesn't. The kind of self-talk that works, the kind of um, daily rituals or routines that work or don't work for you. The kind of, and recognizing the kind of states and the kind of little triggers and anchors that will nudge you towards those states is it, it can make a huge difference. And yet logically, you know, we should be able to just rock up at work and do the task. So I would say just just start to develop a bit of empowerment around your own state of mind because that, I mean, apart from the effect it will have on your work, the effect on your emotional and, and mental freedom can, can be indescribable. Mark McGinnis, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, the newest book is 21 Insights for 21st Century Creatives. The uh, podcast is 21st Century Creative, I believe. And uh, anywhere right. else you'd like for them to get more of you. Um, pretty well. If you go to 21stCenturyCreative.fm, you will get the podcast and then .fm slash 21 insights. You can download the, the ebook edition of the new book for free. Um, and then, you know, those pages, you'll, you'll find links about coaching and, and my other activities. And it looks like I'll be on that podcast as well sometime you soon around will, when this comes out. So you will indeed, David, I'm very much looking forward to the return match. Yeah, looking looking forward to it. If anybody wants to check wants to check that out, go and uh, that get that will down. be all all the archives will be at twenty first century creative fm. So probably around November December this year, uh, David's interview will be out. Great, thanks so much. Thank you. Is love your work helping you find your unique creative voice? Does it bring you the inspiration and motivation you need to become the creator and human you want to be? If so, please be a part of making this a special and nourishing and thoughtful show. Support the show on Patreon. You'll be an even bigger part of this show than you already are. If you contribute just a coffee a month, you'll be helping support the hosting and production of Love Your Work. Everyone has some unique creative gift to offer the world. Together, we can give people the tools they need to bring that work into the world the world will be better off for it. Visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash Cadavy. This is a different kind of model for supporting the work you love. The choice is yours. Vote with your dollars, put your money where your mind is, and keep Love Your Work going. Visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash Cadavy. As a thank you, you'll get early access, bonus content, and a discount on Love Your Work merchandise. Learn more at patreon.com slash Cadavy. That's patreon.com slash K-A- D as in David, A, B as in Victor, Y. Love Your Work is brought to you in part by our Patreon supporters, such as mini sponsor Roxana Maynard of Agility Alchemist at agilityalchemist.com, and top supporters such as Jeffrey Mason and Vitas Pankovicius.
This has been Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. The theme music for this show is At Sea by Dorena from the album About Everything and More by arrangement with Deep Elm Records at deepelm.com. Love Your Work is a production of Cadavy, Inc.,